From the Epic of Gilgamesh to Greek alchemists, people sought immortality through elixirs, magical plants, and divine favor. Hippocrates and Galen wrote about regimens for healthy living, diet, exercise, balance of humors to maintain vitality. In the 1970s, aging was proven genetically programmed and regulated. But today, we're trying to make aging reversible and engineerable. My friend Martin, who is doing research in the field of longevity science, texted a few months ago with an idea. What if the longevity field had its own dollar to kilogram to orbit metric? So we decided to do a deep dive into this frontier, interviewing experts who are doing the science and can tell us more about the state of the art, the field's history, and what we need to do in order to make life and health span breakthroughs. But first, what exactly is aging? Well, aging is pretty complicated. No one really understands it. And so this idea like, oh yeah, we have to tweak these 17 things. It's less cool to people than like, oh, just this one reprogramming and then we're done. Aging is really the loss of function in cells, tissues, and organisms that occurs over the course of their lives. And so for us, by fixating on function, how healthy is this organism? How well does this cell work as our North Star? We think it's actually pretty easy to define aging. This is Jacob co-founder and president of New Limit. He and his team are working on epigenetic reprogramming therapies. Before that, he was at Calico. It's funny because I saw this paper a few years ago that there is no such thing as aging. What if, like, it's actually a non-existent phenomenon. So I think it's still sort of like at an existential state. This is Lada. Now she's working on a stealth bio startup that's also focused on longevity. All we can measure right now is sort of like the end state stage of damage of like, we know how health looks like, and then we see what damage looks like, but we don't know what connects those to it. And there are two big topics that emerged in aging space in the past, I'd say, 10 years. One of them is epigenetic reprogramming, or the idea is that we can use epigenetic layer to reset the age of a cell by introducing these transcription factors called Yamanaka factors. It's basically a series of chemical marks either directly on DNA or near some proteins that DNA wraps around, like a string upon a spool. And those marks tell a given cell which genes to use at which times. Most of your cells are only using a small subset of the genes within your genome at any given time. So this plays into aging because as we age, those chemical marks on top of DNA and its environs get degraded. So an aged cell no longer can use the right repertoire of genes in response to its environment. And that means that it's much less functional than a younger version of that same cell would be. Another one is the idea of epigenetic clocks. Aging clocks are models, usually built with AI or statistics that take in biomarkers and predict biological age. Epigenetic aging clocks measure chemical tags on DNA that drift in predictable ways as we get older. The idea is, if you can measure aging precisely, you can tell if someone is aging faster or slower than average, and test whether an intervention, like a drug, a diet, or a therapy, could slow it down. So right now, like, I don't know, there's a dozen, two dozen, whatever, and they'll sell you aging tests. And of course, the problem is that the aging tests are not validated. So you'll get something. My friend got a thing that said that she was 12. Like, I don't think she's 12. <laughs> I did a bunch of blood tests and they included this epigenetic age test in the panels that I did. And it says that I'm 12 years old, which honestly, I don't even know if it's good. Like, there is probably like a point which you're like too young, maybe I'm Benjamin Button or something. <laughs> The quest to extend healthy human life is really about finding people bold enough to take on problems that once felt impossible. And that's exactly what the sponsor of this video, E1 Ventures, is about. They believe the future isn't just about progress, but about purpose. E1 supports founders tackling the hardest frontiers, from AI to robotics to biology, helping bring bold ideas into the world with meaning at the core. If you're building something bold and looking for investors dedicated to backing your vision and journey, reach out to E1 today. Now, back to the science of longevity and what it tells us about the future of human health. All right, so now that we know a bit more about aging, let's get into the question of this video. There is a metric that has defined the recent breakthroughs of the new space industry. Over the past decades, it's what everyone has been fighting for. How cheap can you make that number? Well, so, so we're talking about a pathway though, but is that the dollar per kilogram metric to optimize for? Because you're sort of talking about, in this case, the bio clock is the rocket, but what is the actual like metric you think we should optimize for? The accuracy of the clock. So I think the how right are we with the predictive tools we have available? If I can do something and then I can try to predict, is this going to make humans younger? And I am correct one in a million times, then it's totally useless, right? How do you know whether it's working or not? If you really have to like go 10 years and spend $100 million uh, before you really get like a good signal, uh, and if this is good, 
you can just see that the iteration cycle time is dramatic. But once we have that number, now you can like iterate and optimize. I posted this question on X and got several answers. The first of which was from Jacob. And he said it was healthy years divided by cost. It's difficult to measure, but I think ultimately all of healthcare should be optimizing that one metric. How healthy are you for how long and how much did you spend to get there? I do think we have examples of medicines that strike a near maxima on the healthy years per dollar criterion. A few examples of these would be things like statins, which, you know, not only were hugely remunerative in their time, but after going generic, now give the average American about an extra year of healthy life due to prevention of cardiovascular disease for pennies on the dollar. And so trying to make medicines for that broad population, medicines for everyone, for all of us, I think is really the way to maximize that metric. But it's been difficult within the industry in the past few decades to galvanize the support needed to go after one of these moonshot attempts that is admittedly going to be more difficult to realize than a more narrow medication that maybe doesn't strike as high on that healthy years per dollar measure. I think for me, this would be the number of hypotheses tested per unit of time. If we assume that we only run like one to two multimorbidity, all-cause mortality trials every few years, that's less than 50 trials run by the time we are gone. And that's that may feel like a lot, but given that the success rate in drug discovery is like less than 1%, it just means that we are nowhere near close to the number of things tested per unit of time. I think it's an interesting upstream metric. So I'll be a little a little pedantic here and say, you know, if you think about the high output management style of how to measure your progress, Andy Grove has this funny analogy of a breakfast factory. And he talks about if you're trying to make breakfast, ultimately what you really care about is like number of people with breakfast on the plate. To me, that's the sort of healthy years per dollar metric. And upstream, he describes, well, you might want to measure things like number of eggs cracked, you know, number of frying pans on the burners. Like those are all upstream, but they don't directly translate. And I kind of think of number of experiments in the same way. It's a necessary criterion, but not a sufficient one. So you can run lots of experiments, but if they're the wrong experiments, it doesn't matter too much. The end destination here has to be making real products that real people can access that keep them healthier in the same way that within your diner, ultimately customers don't care about how many people are in the kitchen. They care about how long their food took to come out and how it tastes at the end. All right, so we got a lot of answers to this dollar per kilogram metric question, a question of finding the right measurement to optimize for in longevity. Lada says it's the number of hypotheses tested per unit of time. Jacob thinks it's healthy years divided by cost. Martin thinks it's the accuracy of the aging clock. Unlike new space, longevity hasn't found its dollar per kilogram to orbit yet. It's unifying measure of progress. But maybe finding the right metric to optimize could propel longevity research into its next era. So why should we care about longevity research? Because from the outside in, it kind of seems like it's just a bunch of billionaires that want to live forever. Yeah, so one, I, I don't think it's the actual reality, but I totally appreciate why folks view it that way. And I think the reason that there are many folks who have been successful in other domains coming into longevity is pretty obvious. It's, it's something that all of us would do if we had the same resources. If you imagine you have resources beyond your wildest extent, you have some number of consumption goods you can cons you can consume. But what is the ultimate product? What is the thing you would ultimately want to buy above all others? It's health and time. You would want to stay healthier longer, you'd want to stay younger longer, and you'd want more time to do the things that you find fulfilling to spend with your loved ones. Okay, so the goal is lifespan expansion, but not at the expense of good health span. Lifespan is just how long you live. Health span is how long you actually feel good and function during those years. Ideally, you want to increase both together. Critics of longevity research argue that there are ethical concerns to people living longer. Overpopulation, economic disruptions to pension systems, retirement ages, etc. For some, aging feels like a natural law we should obey, something that we shouldn't tamper with. You know, aging is the number one driver of cancer, of heart disease, of dementia, of like arthritis and pain. If you believe that you could treat all these things, obviously, like, if the pill is there, people are gonna take it. I think some of the interventions the longevity community is developing that try and keep you healthy longer rather than just treat you once you're already very, very sick 
from a cost perspective and in terms of how many years you're going to get are actually going to be more efficient, more broadly distributed, more easily accessible than the most intensive end of life care or the most intensive care might be after you've become very sick. I think everyone should think about the longevity industry as trying to give them access to the product all of us want. The ability to turn a relatively small number of dollars into a relatively large amount of health and time with our families. As Andy Grove said, you can't manage what you can't measure. Finding the right metric may be the key to steering longevity research forward. In old age, memory fades. The body breaks down. But what if it didn't? What if you could have more of those moments and memories with people you love? This is a problem that you can solve. You can be a part of this grand challenge to extend healthy years of human lifespan. It's the early days in this field, and the definitions aren't even clear yet. And it's ripe for disruption in science. Thank you for watching this video. This is a new style of video we're trying out on the channel. Internally, we're calling them lighthouse videos. And so the hope is that we can plant a clear lighthouse in the distance to guide us and sail towards as we develop these technologies. Thanks again for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. It's a new format. And as always, until next time, keep on building the future.